pushing buttons and pulling triggers. This is Gun Funny. Welcome to Gun Funny episode 298. Today I'm going to chat with Patrick McCorrow from Beretta, discuss an injunction against the ATF's unconstitutional brace rule, highlight a new forgotten accessory, and talk about a bizarre tale of a microwave at a hospital. I am your host, Ava Flanell. Patrick, how are you doing today? I'm doing all right, Ava. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I know you mentioned before the show started that you had really bad allergies, so which we'll let listeners know so that if you're not on your A game, totally fine. We'll just blame it on the allergies. <laughs> yeah. I'm not having fun right now, but I will I will push through it for sure. And if I sound like an evil villain, again, I I apologize. You're like usually I sound what would you say you normally sound like? Like somebody who's like, you know, like sultry, you know, sort of <laughs> <laughs> just yeah, just yeah, wondering yeah. you know just so listeners can get an idea but i guess pe- people would say i'm a little more upbeat and manic at times you know? <laughs> yeah. so but i'm a little low-key uh, low yeah key right now so i get it i totally get it before we start the show man i just have to vent for a second so you just had your Please. moment i gotta have my moment give me the spotlight for a second so <laughs> listeners know i bought a brand new house this year And I'm thinking like, cool, brand new, everything, you know, is just like, there's not going to be any issues. I did all the upgrades. so I don't have to deal with any contractors. And it has just been one nightmare after another. And it's not an inexpensive house. And it's in a really nice neighborhood, like one of the top neighborhoods in Colorado Springs. And it's been like, I think they just hired, I think contractors are, are tough to come by, like good ones. But I also think they just hired like the cheapest contractors ever. And because there's been so many issues where they've had to come in and out of my house to fix stuff, and it's been a nightmare. Anyways, oh, no. I, I think I said this on the last podcast, we had a ton of rain. Like, I think we got more rain in three days than we typically get in a few months or something or in, in a year. It was something crazy. The builder, they graded the area, you know, accordingly so that, you know, like when it does rain or it snows, like the water goes in certain directions. Well, apparently they didn't do that well because I just got back from Utah a few days ago and there is like sinkholes all around my house. My entire house probably sunk probably about a foot, if not more. Oh, no. And there's like concrete, like foot little stepper things. There's like sinkholes in that. One person, I guess there was like such a bad like sinkhole or something happened where she couldn't even get out of her freaking garage because the driveway was messed up. And it turns out it's not just my house, but our entire street. And so we've had the builder come. She inspected it. She inspected my house. She hasn't inspected everyone's yet on the block. But she was like, yeah, we just, you know, we can only grade it and pack down the dirt like 90, 95%. And we just got a lot of rain, but we'll fix it. But I personally, I'm going to have somebody come to look at the foundation to make sure that there's, they're not just trying to throw a bandaid on it because I don't even trust these builders anymore. Right. But yeah, it's been one thing after another. And I just want to say that sometimes being an adult just sucks. (laughs) And (laughs) buying a brand new house is not like you think you're avoiding so many headaches and you're not like, I'm just like, man, that used house is looking so good right now. (laughs) Right. right. I bought my first house uh, down here in Austin. So last year, so that was my first big foray into hashtag uh, adulting. So Luckily, it's been okay. So, knock on wood. I'm guessing it was but, a used house. Well, yeah, it was. Well, it was built in 2018, and we bought it from a young couple that was that apparently had twins or was expanding their family like rapidly. So they just needed to, you know, get a bigger house. So they were the only ones there. So they took really good care of it. Good. You know, and when we got it inspected and all that kind of stuff, which was hilarious because I never again my first house I ever built. You know. Yeah. Or not built, but purchased. But, yeah. and, uh, and I was going through the whole process and, you know, the inspector came. I was like, I was like, dude, I don't know what I'm supposed to say, but I, 
<laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. Well, somebody uh, yesterday, they were like, where do you have a sub pump? And they asked me something else. And and they're like, well, what is this? And I'm like, man, you are asking the wrong person. And I'm right. the only one who lives here. I don't have a husband. I don't have some guy that's like, oh, hold on. My boyfriend's going to be home. Like, we'll talk to right. him. Like, I'm in this alone. And I'm like, hold on. Let me Google and pull that up. <laughs> Right, exactly. But yeah, exactly. it's yeah. So, anyways, we will see. Uh, hopefully, I have the inspectors coming out tomorrow. So, hopefully, I have some good news. You know that I'll share with you guys next week on how things are going. And then I just get my landscaping fixed, which my landscaping was not inexpensive. So for the longest time, like all the companies that I were talking to, they were like, "Yeah, starting price is fifty thousand." I still Ooh. ended up spending about thirty thousand on my landscaping and. By no means is this a big property. It's very small. It's in a housing development. Right. I'm like, cool. It just all got screwed up. It's okay. Where's my paper bag so I could breathe in and out of it? It's fine. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, Yeah. But anybody who's listening, if you are not an adult yet, I mean, I would imagine there's not a whole lot of kids listening to my podcast, but seriously, adulting is a trap. Do not be in a hurry to grow up because it's very overrated. No yeah. Yes. Just enjoy it. One day at a time, y'all. Yep. All right. So before we start the show, Smith & Wesson. If you're looking for a new PCC, especially one that folds up for easy transport, check out the folding pistol carbine, the FPC from Smith & Wesson. It's chambered in nine millimeter and only 16 and a half inches folded up. It comes with three M and P mags, one 17 round, and then two 23 round mags. There's storage for two mags in the butt stock. It folds to the left side so that your optic can remain mounted. Unlike a lot of the other, you know, folders on the market. The folding mechanism is also pretty robust and easy to use compared to others. It has an M lock four end for accessories and full length rail on top. The barrel is threaded so you can suppress it and it comes in a very nice carrying case. Best of all, MSRP is only $659. If you want to check this out, head on over to smith-wesson.com. Learn the things you never knew on Deconstructing the Industry. Patrick, recently I met you at, it was the NRA show, I believe. And uh, just, it was briefly, I know we were all tired. It's crazy how (laughs) those shows just like, everyone just, you know, you have like rings around your eyes. Everyone just kind of looks like zombies. Even I think after the first day, I was like, I'm exhausted. So I think it was the last day of NRA that I met you, but you kind of briefly told me about the clothing line that you came out with and that's ultimately what you do is you help design Beretta's clothing line but I'm curious as to like you know sort of your background and how you got to this point sure let me see back up a couple years well I was in New York corporate retail fashion menswear for about about close to 11 years and Probably the last year I was approached by a headhunter that I had worked with in my industry. So totally night night and day in terms of, you know, our current market that we're in and uh, discussing is more, let's just call it like on the fashion side. Yeah. Men's wear specific. And then that's, that's, that's always what, uh, what I've done, just a, a passion for, for clothes and development. But I got approached by, I'm not going to say her name or then put her on blast, but uh, she knows who, uh, who she is. Uh, you know, she approached me, say, hey, I, I need a favor. You know, I'm, I'm trying to help out the, this company. I can't really tell you that much about it, but just go to this address and just tell me what you think. And I was like, okay. So over the weekend, I went and, ch- and checked it out and it, ha- and it turned out that it was the our New York gallery store on Madison Avenue. And I'd been in New York at that point for like 10 years. And I I knew about the Red Eye just because my my dad was in the military and we have a you know strong military background on both sides of my family. So I knew about the Red a hundred percent. And I just was like, what the hell? There is a Beretta store in New York City on Madison Avenue. I just was I just was shocked. 
Yeah, that is. So I don't know if you know anything about me, but I actually lived in New York City for like eight years. So even I'm oh, as nice. I'm hearing this, I'm like, where is this? Was this new? No, I've been there since 1995. <laughs> what? So Madison Avenue and what? And 63rd. That's so crazy. It's insane. It's like two. It's like two. It was two blocks. Well, when Barney's was still there, it's about uh, two blocks north of uh, Barney. So it was it was crazy. So I walked in. And, you know, it was very what I had. I don't know what I was expecting as I walked in, but, you know, it felt very old world. And I don't know if it's, if you've ever had a chance to visit our, our galleries or see our premium side mm -hmm. of the business it was very global. You know, you walked in a lot of like exotic mounts like, uh, like on the walls and, you know, very, let's just say the demographic was skewing very old. <laughs> uh, and so I walked around went to, to the mezzanine where I saw some, you know, that's where they had some, let's call it more of the, it's called the, the hunting and shooting gear. And the, in the main floor was more, it's called like lifestyle or after the hunt or lodge wear. And then I walked to the third floor or went up to, to, to the third floor and it was this massive, you know, racks upon racks of just premium shotguns and rifles. And I was like, whoa, this is crazy. Uh, yeah, crazy in a crazy in a good way. I just was shocked. You know? I know. I I'm like, still kind of really cool. I'm still shocked. Like, sorry to cut you off, but I think because I'm <laughs> no, just like, please. wait, what? I literally just googled Beretta New York City, and yeah, Beretta Gallery, and it shows pictures, and it's like it looks like just a very high end, you know, for oh, it's like beautiful. you yeah. know, like the old guys that are just have all the money and they spend like you know they buy like the fifty thousand dollar shotguns and but I'm also like this is in freaking New York City. And who the hell's even buying these guns? Who's even getting, you know, like, because to buy a gun in New York is like, you have to jump through so many hoops. Oh, sure. For so sure. How do, for so sure. also, how does the store even stay in business? That's kind of what I'm thinking as well. Well, they have a lot of visitors and there's a lot of, let's just call it, you know, there's a lot of fanboys and, and uh, uh, fangirls, gals mm -hmm. yeah. that, you know, that are in the city, outside of the city, you know, in the various uh, boroughs and Connecticut and Jersey and things like that. So you know, it's a healthy business. And, you know, we have another uh, gallery store in Dallas in Highland Park uh, Village, which is a different kind of vibe. But, you know, they also have one in London, Milan, London, Paris. Milan Paris. Hello. Exactly. Exactly. So so that's where I got my first little taste, in, you know, and so after I, you know, walked around and kind of did my own uh, assessment, I, I, you know, I called that headhunter and I was like, I was like, okay, what's going on here? She's like, listen, this company, now you know it's Beretta. You know, they are trying to reinvigorate or uh, reassess and, and redevelop their soft goods side of the business. And they're really looking for people outside of the industry that have a full knowledge of development and fabric and fit and everything. And to come in and learn about the brand and learn about the market, you know, and, and aid them in what they want to do. And at the time, I just was like, that sounds so awesome. I don't know if that's what I want to do. Because at that point, you know, 10 years, I was officially a New Yorker and I had worked my tail off, you know, climbed that ladder. Um, and I was like, no, I got, you know, I have roots here now. You know, you know, I, I, have, I don't know you know, where are they located? And they were like, well, their, their headquarters are outside of DC and Southern Maryland. And I was like, oh, I don't know. So, you know, that conversation happened and long story short, there's but, a lot of back hold and on. forth. Can I just, oh, yeah. but Patrick, don't you know that if you can make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I tell that to so many, I tell that, I tell that to my team so many times. Uh, I, I joked so yeah. many times. I was like, but you know what? Nobody <laughs> fucking says how long you got to make it here to make it anywhere. Because oh, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> I was oh, like yeah. there for eight years. And like some years I was right. like, you know what? I'm struggling a little bit. Like, I don't know how much longer I could do this. <laughs> yeah. Well, funny enough, like we had uh, not to get into a rabbit hole, but like when I how I got to New York, there's probably about like 40 of us from Texas, you know, that I went to school with or went to high school with or just were still friends with or, you know, acquaintances, the, the acquaintances and party friends are really close friends. And we all decided one year, I don't know if we decided as a group, but we just it was a weird mi migration that everybody just started to just like move to New York City for, you know, their own, you know, dreams and goals and things like that. And at one point, we had about 40 of us that were in the Lower East Side, you know, and built a little small community, you mm -hmm. know, we had 
And, but funny enough, like year two went by and be, you know, like 10 people dropped, you know, and moved back home or move, you know, move somewhere else. And then like year five came and probably like 20 people, you know, at that point, you know, mm-hmm. like an additional like 15 people left. And I am proud to say that I was out of that group. I was the last one standing before I left for, uh, you know, to join the Reddit down in DC. So, and I just want to backtrack for a second. So can you tell us like what you were doing? those 10 years, like in New York, like any of the companies that you used to work for or? Uh, yeah. Well, I worked for, well, I, what got me there was, um, I don't want to age myself, but I, I, in, in between college and other things that, that I was doing, uh, more on the performance and music side, I was working for the gap mm. and I had, I had, you know, I worked there in high school. I worked there, you know, part-time through college. I worked there part-time and then they were always telling me, you know, and in, in the mix, I I don't know if it's my personality or just, I just was taken to the fact that I just liked what I was doing. And let's just say this to the the young folk that are listening to you. I was with the gap when it was cool. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> <now. So> like, <laughs> I don't want to age myself, but yeah. Well, I so. also, when you said that you were like, Oh, I just bought my first house. I was like, okay, failure to launch. <laughs> but this makes sense yeah. because if you lived in New York, obviously you're not buying anything. I mean, you have to have like millions and millions to, Oh yeah. And even then you buy like a studio. That's like a few million. It's crazy. Yeah, exactly. So that makes sense. Yeah. So I was with the gap and I, I worked there and I, I climbed that, that corporate ladder and, you know, it's, you know, life happens. And, you know, I had, I got approached by one of our VPs that I had met on, you know, at an event and they were like, Hey, if you ever want to take this a little more seriously, we really think that, that you have a knack for this and, and a viable skill set. So that was more like on the retail side. And then I slowly started to get involved in some projects, some focus groups and some projects where I really started to tap into really a, like a understanding the the back end side of development and how we get products to market and things like that. And from there, I did a small stint at Williams Sonoma. I got to give them a shout out because they taught me how to, how to make a, a mean cocktail, but that was not for me. So that was a short lived, <laughs> a short lived little experiment. And then I was recruited and I worked for uh, Ben Sherman for a long time. And they're a, a, a British band. Uh, small facts on them, uh, that company. When the Beatles came to the U.S., they were wearing Ben Sherman, the suits, the shirts, the ties, all that kind of stuff. So it's a very like rock and roll brand, very, let's call it cool, low, uh, Lower East Side uh, mm-hmm. type of a thing uh, based in London. And that's when I really started to travel internationally and work with the stores and work with the product, work with the product development teams and the design teams and really start finding ways to become more get the brand to become more U.S. centric without mm-hmm. losing its heritage. And we had a lot of successes. The U.S. was one of, you know, for, for a time period, uh, you know, the U.S. market was their number one, the fastest growing market with, a, you know, with a very slow growth company. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was, so that was really cool to like be a part of. And that's when I started traveling to you know, to Asia to visit factories and just really, you know, learning, learning from the best in the industry, uh, hands-on, you know, and then while I was in New York, I had a lot of friends that were in photography and fashion, you know, hardcore fashion, major fashion houses. And so I would get called in to do, it's probably how I I lasted so long because you got, you know, you, you got that side hustle and side Mm -hmm. cash, cash flow, uh, coming in, but I would just get contracted out to work with some you know, some really intense high-end brands on some, on some special projects. I mean, I remember the first time I was at Milk Studios down in the meatpacking district. I had a friend that was on set for, you know, a Vogue, a Vogue shoot with Patrick de Machier, one of the, you know, a very famous photographer and just being a part of that process. And I mean, I just was hooked. So just, it was just really cool. Hmm. And then making like networks through there, the party scene and all kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was my experience, you know. Very cool. So, so, yeah. so let's talk about, okay, so, you know, you're kind of offered this job with Breda and you're just like, oh, I don't know what happens after. Well, it was, a, it was a nine month song and dance just going back and forth. And basically what sealed the deal was I called my, my, uh, I called my dad, you know, just, just need, needed some of that rental advice. And I said, listen, here's the thing. I don't know if I want to leave 
New York and everything that I've been doing and, the, you know, and the, because this is a totally different uh, industry. And he reminded me that my brother and I did not follow in his footsteps uh, in the military. <laughs> and, so, and so I took that to heart and I just, I, I contemplated on that. I was like, yeah, I said, I'm going to do this for my dad, you know, and then, and then take that as a challenge, you know, take everything that I've learned in one industry where I succeeded in and try to see if I can transpose that onto a totally different beast. So, and that's what got me to the company. Wow. So packed up everything, moved to Washington. Oh yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. So, and how long has, because before that did, did Breta have a women's line or was um, it just, they just needed no, to? Well, not really. Well, it was primarily when I joined the company, it was a different, it was a different thought process in terms of what they were trying to do. It was very, and right or indifferent, it was very Eurocentric mm -hmm. um, and it was very male dominated in terms of the priorities. We always had a small little subset of women's products, but let's just be, be real. You know, in our clay shooting line, we had a women's vest and we had like six men's vests, mm -hmm. you know, so the, so the ratios were always skewed that way in our upland line, you know, we had a ladies, you know, field vest and that was pretty much it, you know, so we always had a few things, but it was nothing that we were able to really capitalize or focus on or like grow. Mm -hmm. So, and we just really started to look at where we wanted to be in the future. And this is something that I think has kept me around. I just celebrated my nine year anniversary this past Friday with the company. Uh, oh, wow. So but that was pretty cool. And the family, you know, they, and especially Franco Beretta, he's extremely hands-on which I love, you know, we're a privately run company by family, you know, for generations and, you know, they're very hands-on and I think that's extremely motivating. And, you know, he just looked at me in a meeting and said, listen, we need to get our, you know, our soft goods to just to be in line with our focus on like on, on the firearms, it's technical, it's performance, it's pushing the boundaries, it's thinking ahead. You know, I said, okay, well, if that's, what your goal is on the firearm side, we are totally not in line with, with that, like on the soft goods side currently. We're very old world heritage. You know, there's nothing advanced about our designs or our fabrics or the execution, you know. So I said we, you know, we probably need to make a decision on where we want to go. And, you know, probably around 2015 and 2016, we really put the you know, drew a line in the sand and said, yes, let's just move forward with being the most innovative company when it comes to soft goods. So we're totally in line with, with the firearms. And that way, you know, just from a company standpoint, we are, you know, that there's that 360 uh, approach. So, but that took a lot of, that took a lot of effort, not only just in terms of really redefining our design language and where we were going to go and where we're going to land on price points, but also to re-educate or bring along a lot of our tried and true fans mm -hmm. of the brand from a soft goods standpoint in terms of what we were doing. It was a little rocky because, you know, I think people don't like change mm -hmm. <laughs> for the most part. Yeah. Uh, so we, it was a, it was a huge evolution in a really a short amount of time. And in 2018 is when we really started to slowly relaunch ourselves in the market. We started it on the hunting side around upland field and then we moved into waterfowl and then and then clay and then most recently what we're here to, to like talk about is that we really started to really deep dive into performance gear for our pistol shooters and you know we were going to start with men but over the years we were really looking at the data and looking at what was going on within the marketplace and then realizing after we signed Jessica Hook as one of our uh, premier pistol shooters, we don't have anything for women at all. And, you know, with my background in menswear, you know, we definitely needed to take a step back and say, okay, how we're seeing a big hole in the marketplace. We're seeing a big hole in our portfolio from a women's line standpoint where, you know, if we start this, we got to take it slow. So this was probably about a three or three and a half year process. We had, we just launched this line at NRA last month. And you just got to think, you know, three and a half years ago, you know, 
was when we really started to kind of map this out and get to the point where we are now. Wow, that's pretty crazy. Before we talk about what you went through for the design, I'm going to take a quick break, talk about Mantis real quick. If you haven't checked out the Laser Academy from Mantis, I definitely recommend it. It's a great visible way to train with your firearm. The Laser Academy gives you everything that you need to practice with your smartphone app and improve your skills without the cost of ammo. The standard kit comes with a choice of calibers for the laser, a carrying case, two tripods, and target stand holders for $150, or you can get the portable kit for just $99. The app has a bunch of drill options that you can run as well as like a fun practice option to make things interesting. It currently has 14 modes, including dual modes for friendly competition and more in development. Check these products out at mantisx.com. Tell me about just your entire experience from start to finish. So where did you guys even begin with this women's line? Oh, a massive whiteboard. So... (laughs) You know, so I mentioned about three and a half years ago, we made a decision to move forward with the development process. And probably a year before that, we were just gaining a lot of insight. One thing that I love about this company is that we we rely on data, solid data, but we also take that data and actually get out there in the real world, in the field, and see how true that data is and if there's anything, you know, particularly skewed. So, you know, we're hands-on, you know, with our information. And we did recognize that there is a huge opportunity out there and an opportunity, not just from us to, you know, make some product and, you know, make some, and make some sales, but more so just an opportunity around, there's nothing really out there, Mm -hmm. you know? So with my background in menswear, you know, women's wear is a total different beast and it is way more intense than menswear which is probably why I've always I've always been on the men's side of things but we took an approach about just listening we just wanted to hear from end users and just kind of gather as much intel as possible so we had some internal plans to you know speak with shooters that work for us just to kind of get a sense in terms of what was going on And then we really wanted to take an unbiased approach and just open the door to just listen. And we started with some small focus groups with Jessica Hook and a couple other female shooters more on the competitive side, Mm -hmm. just to kind of see, you know, what they had to say. And then from there, you know, that took place for a couple months. And, you know, during the process, I'm kind of just starting to sketch a mood board out. Okay. You know, and when I say like mood board, that's just like images that potentially could be fabric concepts that could be potentially environment, you know, where is this product going to be used? And as that's happening parallel, we just start expanding the focus groups and just start getting more women into the conversation. And then it just turned out to, you know, you know, we had, pistol shooters, all the, you know, from competitive to novice to intermediate, some concealed carry moms, some CrossFit athletes that were, you know, just from a a performance element standpoint. And then we had some, some hunters uh, join the mix also. Mm -hmm. And we had, and then just organically, we just had such a, an amazing vast array of, of personalities. We had, women from the ages, I believe the youngest that we had on the focus group was maybe like 20, 21, all the way up to, I think, 50, 58. So we had a wide demographic of ages. We had, and then we had a wide demographic of body types, heights, and then end use. And that just helped me and the team just fully understand how we could potentially be first to market with something extremely comprehensive that was flexible, that, you know, fit, you know, was, uh, was addressed as best as, as best as we possibly could. And that, you know, we were making these women feel powerful. And I think that was my, not just mine, but our team's like mantra. Like we want to make these women 
look and feel powerful and, and aid in their confidence when they're out there on the field or in a range or in just everyday carry, you know, so that was our goal, you know, and uh, if it wasn't for them and their honesty and their passion for what they do, we couldn't have gotten here. Mm -hmm. So I feel a little weird sometimes, you know, talking about this launch, you know, I'm very excited about it, but I also feel a little weird because I'm a dude talking about a ladies launch, you know, and, and, Hmm. and, and behind the scenes, there was so many amazing women helping me kind of get this, through the finish line. So yeah, definitely. Um, Yeah. You guys came out with, let me go back. So I'm actually just looking at the website right now. Quite a few t-shirts, a fleece jacket, a sweater, leggings, vest, and actually there's quite a few soft shell jacket, a combat jacket. And then also uh, it's kind of like cargo pants as well. Yeah. It's like a field pan for sure. Like a multi-field pan. Yeah. 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 I have to say, like, I've been very impressed the first time. Well, actually there's somebody that works with Breda and they contacted me and they were like, Hey, we're about to launch something. Will you sign an NDA? And I was just like, okay. Cause they're like, we know you work with Smith and Wesson, but which I'm not exclusive with Smith and Wesson. And now they only sponsor the podcast, but she, a woman that I spoke to, she was like, but we have something that you might be able to use. And so signed that. And then uh, I kind of forgot about it because this was like a few weeks before NRA and, you know, before NRA, it's all crazy. And then I had the women from Flashbang Holsters. I met up with them. I ran into them and I was like, oh, I really like your jacket. They were both wearing the same jacket. And they were like, oh, girl, you got to go over to Breda. They have all like this clothing line. I was like, oh, yeah, I was supposed to check that out when I was here. But NRA, you know, you have all these plans and then it just seems like time is just gets away from you. So they walked me over there and that's when I met you. And I was like, wow, this is actually like really nice. And I really liked how even the jacket, you guys designed it for like women who have hips instead of it just going straight down, it kind of curves out a little bit, but so it, it definitely like accentuates your curves And even just now, like when I was in Utah, I took the fleece jacket with me and I got a lot of compliments on it, but I don't know, you guys definitely designed comfortable things. And then even the pants, I tried on the pants. I like it because I'll be honest, like the 5'11 pants, 5'11 lately is just kind of dead to me. I'm not the biggest fan. I feel like they were doing okay. And now I'm like, I don't know what the hell happened to the company, but, and I don't even know if they're even really that pro two way anymore, but I had some pants and it just felt like it like pushed down my butt. Like these pants were made for men or something. Whereas I'm like, you know, women do have like a butt, like let's not push it down and make me look like I have like a pancake butt. I mean, don't have a huge butt, but you know, let's, let's maybe accentuate some stuff. And, but that was the first thing that I noticed is it made your butt kind of pop a little bit. It had all the pockets. It had extra stitching like in the knees and it also had like extra fabric so that if you do get on your knees or something, it's not stretching out the pants. And yeah, it was just designed really thoughtfully. And I was really pleasantly surprised. I didn't really expect much. Also thinking that, you know, cause this is the gun industry and the gun industry mm-hmm. still doesn't really cater to women. So I was yeah. kind of thinking like, Oh cool. It's going to be, you know, it's not going to be great. And right. yeah, I was the only thing that I didn't really care for were the leggings, the leggings, fit me a little weird. And I just requested a large, maybe because I have big hips, but even that it was kind of nice because they have like the pockets, they seem breathable. So yeah, I mean, I was really impressed with the clothes and then I told a few other people about it as well. And yeah, you did a good job. And it's, well, it's also, it looks that. good. It's not like, you know, oh, cool. Pink and purple. Like it's like, it's still like kind of tactical, but I also could wear it every day. Yeah, that was like, there was two things that I think I'm allowed to say and not get slapped around, but the ladies told me and all of our, all of our groups and, and focus groups and, and meetings are like, just make our ass look amazing. Right. <laughs> okay. Point, I said, point take it, point take it. You know, and the other thing too, is just like, is there, like if you put pink or purple on any of this, you know, like you're uh, dead to us. Said, yes. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. point take it. So, you know, we really just, you know, one of the things that I, I'm, I'm going to 
point this out and maybe it'll, you know, I, maybe I shouldn't, but, you know, I just, for all the w- uh, women out there and everything that I've learned over the past, uh, you know, three and a half years is you, you can't say, you know, in our market, you know, you can't say that you're going to make women's clothing and then take a man's jacket and just cut it in half and yeah. just say, Hey, here you go. That's what we found a lot, you know, in a lot of our, a lot of the brands in the outdoor and, and shooting markets, it, it's just like, how insulting is that? That mm-hmm. you're not even taking the, the time to actually just consider fit. Yeah. I mean, it's a pain in the butt. I mean, it's art. I mean, don't get me wrong. That was probably the most intense part of the process. You know, once we got the designs locked in was just figuring out, okay, how are we going to, how are we going to standardize fit, but then also make it work for a wide variety of uh, body types Mm -hmm. you know that was that was probably the most intense part and we're not 100 percent perfect by no means but i think you know we got started you know we're we're at a good point in terms of where we are starting up from but Mm -hmm. yeah i mean you gotta and if you're going to brands out there listen up if you're going to say that you're going to do women's product you got to study the female form absolutely so yeah i couldn't agree more with that i'm going to take another quick break talk about gators I brought four different pairs of Gators eyewear with me to the Utah event. And have you been to Utah, Patrick? Yes, I love Utah. Okay, Utah's beautiful, like depending where you are, but we were in Provo and surrounded by mountains. And it's very similar to Colorado, but the mountains like in Colorado seem like they're miles away and they are. But like in Provo, you almost feel like you could just reach out and touch them and they're still like snow capped and it was just freaking gorgeous. And I could not, I honestly, I I hate to say this, but I almost got into a few car accidents with my rental car because I'm just like driving, just looking up almost like, you know, if you were in New York city and you're walking, just looking up at the sky, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm looking at the mountains and I'm just like, man, like so (laughs) taken away. And then I'm like, oh yeah, I'm driving like, oh, you know, as I almost get into an accident, but I did notice, and I saw like an ad that Gators did where it was saying that Gators, their lenses, it it helps like, I forget the terminology and I probably should have looked this up, but it helps kind of like clarify things and, and increase the colors. And I noticed like this is the first time, maybe also because, you know, a lot of the ear pro I'm wearing indoors, but I kept thinking, I'm like, when I took my ear pro off, or I'm sorry, my eye pro I noticed that the colors weren't as vibrant and it wasn't as clear. It was almost like the difference. I don't know how your eyesight is, but I wear contacts, but almost like the difference of like not wearing contacts versus wearing contacts or putting your glasses on like your prescription. And I don't know how they managed to do that, but it was almost like you were on drugs and it just made everything so much more vibrant. And it was amazing. And I even had a few people in the car with me. I'm like, check this out. Like, and they were all really impressed because I'm like, I'm not just hallucinating, right? Like this is making things look so much better, which I have to believe when you're shooting, especially outdoors, it's also going to intensify those sites that target, you know, the site picture and all of that. And I just consistently continue to be blown away by these glasses. If you guys want to check it out, head on over to gators.com forward slash Ava If you use that URL, you are going to get 15% off. Let's talk about something that you mentioned at NRA, because I was trying to figure out what size I was. And you guys are like, well, we have dressing rooms here. You can go in. And I was like, I'm too tired. Like, I know if I take my (laughs) pants off, they're staying off and we're not in a position to. (laughs) But, you know, it's like I hate going to dressing rooms and like trying Mm -hmm. on stuff. It's almost like you have to drink a bunch of coffee and you're like, all right, let's, you know, tackle this. And. Yeah, I just I was like, I'm just not in the mood. I'm exhausted. And so you brought up something interesting that I, you know, that I'm think I know most women already know this, but depending on what brand you're using, it definitely Oof. like sizing can be mm-hmm. such like I know, like, you know, at certain places, like in jeans, I'm like a size five or a seven. And then other places I'm like a size freaking 10 or 11 or something. Or, you know, small, large, like it's, it's crazy. It's like all across the board. And you said something really interesting how, I guess you guys were measuring the actual like waistband and it Mm -hmm. was like, how much of a difference was it making? 
Uh, and depending on the brand, it was anywhere between, you know, an inch to two and a half inches of, of differences brand to brand. So it was jaw dropping in terms of on the men's side, there's similar issues, but not that drastic. Mm -hmm. Like if that makes sense, it's, you know, the guys are pretty much standardized to an extent. On the women's side, we started deep diving and I would say less on the Less in the fashion world, it's pretty much standardized. But when I was looking at our market, let's call it outdoor and shooting, and let's call it like athleisure, I mean, it was all over the board. It, I was just like, what are they doing here? And then I, you know, when we started to really deep dive into it, and I, you know, just for your listeners, I mean, when I say we deep dived, I mean, we purchased or we had women bring in the brands that uh, that they're wearing in a various size and we just measured it. I mean, we measured everything and then we compared it to, a, you know, a, you know, our design charts and there's just standardization just in general within production. And I'm like, Whoa, this is insane. And then I started feeling re really bad for, uh, for the women out there. I was like, how do they shop? You know, when it's all over the place. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, especially just online shopping, if you're not trying it on, I just, exactly. I, I'm like, okay, we're going to get a small, medium and large and one of them has got yeah. to fit. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. And what we real, yeah. And what we realized on that was like, the brands are probably taking a, you know, a few different uh, approaches or either doing an exact measurement. And that, when I say exact measurement, you're taking, you know, a measuring tape, you're going around your hips, you're going around your waist, you're going around your bust and you're going around your thighs. And that's the true measurement and that's what's typically done like like in the fashion world so if you're saying you have like a, a 26 inch, inch waist that equates to a size a size one like in the fashion world it's pretty much standard when we were you know the brands that we were measuring like a 26 you know waist in inches i mean they were saying it's a size zero or a size one or a size two or even a size four and i was like well that's that's odd so we took the approach of looking at our initial launch for, you know, especially let's just talk about pants. But I said, okay, let's try to find a way where we can kind of develop this from a sizing standpoint where it's sort of in between. And then what we did was add, we added some in the pants, in like in the waistband, we added hidden elastic. So depending on, you know, smaller or a little bit larger, you know, you could fit within a size. And I think that's how we've been able to kind of look at what's currently out there in the market, develop and size scale our, our products to kind of meet, uh, meet in the middle, mm -hmm. but add those design details that are typically hidden. So women, you know, don't lose their confidence in saying, Oh God, you know, I, I you know, in this brand, I'm like a, you know, I'm like a four, but here I'm like a, you know, I'm like a six or something like that. So yeah, um, that makes been, yeah, it was a pain in the ass, but you know, so far, you know, I would say nine out of 10 women at NRA that actually went into our fitting rooms to try things on came out pretty happy. Mm -hmm. And that's, and that's a big win for us. Oh yeah, so. absolutely. Cause I mean, yeah. we do, especially female bodies just vary so significantly. Definitely a win. The one thing I would say though, about the pants is uh, because I'm tall and like almost five, eight, I wish you guys had a little bit of a longer length. Like if you guys offered it in like short, regular and long, I don't know if that's that, something you thought yeah, about. Yeah, that but. is, yes, that is something that we are working towards in the, in the near yeah. future. So as uh, if not to, you know, not to like overcomplicate things, but you're like, cool, we finally have a product that, you know, pleases nine out of 10 women. And I'm like, but yeah. if you did this, <laughs> well, yeah, well, we knew in the process, cause we had some tall women who were five, eight, five, nine, even five, 10 in our focus groups. And mm -hmm. we had some petite ladies so we, we knew for the for the initial launch this year we weren't going to be 100 percent perfect yet but we just knew that we just needed to get it out so we can get the word of mouth and start showing some results to our um our financial holders yeah um so that we can get more investment <laughs> yeah that makes in, sense in, in bringing you know and in, in, in expanding so you know that definitely is on our short-term list of things to, to uh, get accomplished in the in the near future. So nice. Do you have any future plans that you can share with us? Hmm. I'll just say 2026 is our 500 year anniversary as a company, which is insane to me. Yeah. And 
I didn't realize it was that long. Dang. Yeah. So 2026 is our official 500 year anniversary. And we got some plans coming for that. We're going to be celebrating all year. And I'm actually flying to Italy in two weeks to finalize some plans on some special products and projects. So that's pretty much all I can say. Like right now, I'm just going to try to be the hype man. I just know that 2026, starting in January, uh, SHOT Show, all the way through the end of the year, we're going to be introducing and launching some exclusives, some short runs, and some new products to celebrate our 500-year anniversary. So Awesome. Well, I'll be on the lookout for my party invite. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to be having, I think, we're trying to have parties, I think, in every single region. We're trying to go to all the major areas and just i think there was even talk at one point like last year of, of having like a party bus that kind of drove around to all the major like national and regional shoots and wow. events and things like that. yeah i mean when i tell you like we are planning something big for our 500 year like anniversary it will be year long wow be pretty cool so yeah that's exciting okay so if anybody wants to check out the clothing line what is the website for that loretta.com a slash E N U S. That is our Loretta website. And they can also find us on Amazon.com as well. Oh, okay, cool. That's I didn't know that. And then we just launched. Yeah, we just launched. Very cool. And then also as far as like social media, because I know there's a lot of Beretta, like fake Beretta accounts, but what is the one within <laughs> the US? I know it's frustrating. Like when I was trying to it tag is, you guys, yeah. I was like, oh my gosh, where is it? It's Beretta underscore USA. All right, is, that should take you. And Beretta official is our is our global one. That's that's um, the team in Italy handles. And Beretta underscore USA is what our team here in, in the states drives. So okay, cool, very cool. You know, I actually when I went to college, I wanted to go to college for fashion. And I thought about going to like FIT. Uh, mm -hmm. I went to an all women's Catholic school my freshman year. I don't know if anybody knows this. I got straight A's. There was absolutely no distractions, but I only <laughs> lasted, I know, I only lasted a week though in fashion design classes because I'll admit like a lot of the women were freaking so mean. And then yeah. we, we went somewhere where no, not to like categorize, you know, or, or I guess not categorize, but you know, make it seem like all guys that are in fashion are gay, but there's a lot of gay guys and they were straight up like bitches. Like they were so mean. And <laughs> all I kept thinking was, and I've seen like, I'm telling you, if you go to Chelsea, because I lived, that was my last apartment was near Chelsea. And yeah. I'd be like sitting at a restaurant and there'd be like next to some gay guys. And they would talk shit about everybody that would like walk down the street. They'd be like, oh, look at her shoes. What is she doing? Oh, girl, no. Granted, I'm not hating on any gay guys. You know, I'm not like, do whatever makes you happy. I really don't care. They actually crack me up. I have quite a few friends that are gay. But back then I was thinking, okay, if I pursue a career like this, I'm going to have to be dealing with people like those bitchy girls, the bitchy guys. <laughs> and like, I really just, I just wanted to design clothes. So yeah. ended up getting out of that immediately and then got a degree in English and communications. Very yeah cool. yeah it's a it, it's a like but like, like i said if you can make it there you can make it anywhere but it's also those are huge hurdles i would say <laughs> one thing i don't miss it you know in like in the fashion world is just there is those types of personalities which are just like just mean girls you, yeah. like, you know what i mean like yeah. don't make me feel like shit i'm already stressed off enough, i know you know, exactly so. <laughs> i know i get it all right. Awesome. Well, guys, check out Bretta's line. Moving on with the rest of the show. So BSF Barrels. If you want to bring your next AR bill to another level, a great place to start is your barrel. BSF Barrels makes some incredible carbon fiber tension barrels. What that means is they've built with a very low profile barrel, but they have a carbon fiber sleeve and tension on the barrel, which gives it the rigidity of a bull barrel without the weight. So for comparison, a standard M4 profile, like a 16 inch barrel weighs about 28 ounces. A BSF 16 inch 223 wild barrel weighs only 23.7 ounces, but it's got the rigidity of a 0.875 bull barrel. So pretty cool. Uh, if you want to check it out, 
Don't forget to use the code ELITE15, all one word. That's E-L-I-T-E-1-5. That's going to get you 15% off your entire order. And that is at bsfbarrels.com. Politics. What is going on in the world today? It's political AF. Today in politics, this has been circulating all over the internet this last week, so I wanted to talk about it. The Fifth Circuit grants injunction on brace rule. On Tuesday, a three-judge panel of the Fifth Circuit Court issued an injunction in the Mock versus Garland case challenging the constitutionality of the ATF's brace rule. The panel is waiting to hear arguments in the case, which has been expedited so that they will be hearing arguments at the first available date. Oral arguments have been scheduled in the case for June 29th. The injunction was granted by the panel after plaintiffs demonstrated that they were likely to succeed in the merits of the case. The case brought by FPC Firearms Policy Coalition and Maxim Defense argues the new rule violates the Administrative Procedures Act because the ATF does not have the authority to make such regulation in bypassing Congress. Additionally, the rule violates the rule of lenity, which states if a law is ambiguous, it must be interpreted for the people, not the government. Additionally, Maxim Defense has demonstrated the rule caused irreparable harm since they have had to fire 13 people since the collapse of the brace market since ATF issued the rule, which I definitely believe. Even though this case only applies to plaintiffs, it strengthens the case for other injunction requests. GOA, Gunners of America in Texas, have a case at the district court level asking for temporary restraining orders and preliminary injunctions. The panel of judges in that case may be swayed to issuing a nationwide injunction against the rule. If this doesn't happen, the new rule goes into effect on June 1st. The panel in Mock versus Garland has scheduled a response for FPC's motion for response to clarify who is covered by the injunction for June 2nd. So in other words, you won't know if you're covered until after the rule is in effect. It may only apply to FPC members, only Maxim Defense customers, or everyone. We just don't know yet. At this point, your best bet is to take off the brace. Though on that front, in typical ATF fashion, they are contradicting themselves. Surprise, surprise. The rule language includes remove and destroy or modify so that it can't be used. They issued that some language in a recent communication to FFLs. However, the director testified before Congress that all you had to do was take it off and they don't care about the piece of plastic. He was specifically questioned by Thomas Macy about quote unquote constructive possession. ATF also just added an item on their FAQ about how it depends on the circumstances of the case if it is compliant. So basically that means that if they have a chance to go after you, they'll say whatever they want. But yeah, in the meantime, I would say before June 1st, if you guys haven't, maybe, I mean, for me, I've said this before, I'm public. I've obviously shown a lot of my guns on social media. If you haven't, it's up to you, whatever you want to do. I'm personally just going to take my braces off for now waited out. I'm absolutely not going to register anything because they are definitely dangling like a piece of fruit in front of you. And it might seem like a great idea, but I think it's a horrible idea if you take that again up to you, but that is what I'm doing. But stay tuned to see what happens with that. Caldwell If you're into skeet or trap, definitely check out the Claymore Target Thrower. I actually just got it in the mail yesterday, so I don't know if I got one that maybe it's not available on the website just yet, but that means that they are ramping up to make them available to the public, or maybe they are by the time that this show comes out. But this is great news, especially, you know, just in time for summer. Patrick, you mentioned that you like kind of go hunting. Do you do a lot of like clay shooting at all? Okay. I don't know what happened to Patrick, but he just left. Maybe he got booted off. But anyways, I personally don't do a lot of clay shooting. When I was in Utah, we went to a range that was the first ever indoor clay shooting range in the U.S. I believe now there's three of them. That was a freaking like so much fun. But the one thing that 
I didn't love was I wasn't good at it. I definitely am not really that great with shotguns. So this is going to give me the ability to practice. What's great about the Claymore is it's a thrower. It's not electric. It doesn't need electricity or a battery. It holds 50 clays and you can operate it with your foot and it throws the clays anywhere from 55 to 70 yards and it has multiple modes. So if you want to check this out, head on over to caldwellshooting.com. Again, it's called the Claymore. And if you use the code GUNFUNNY10, all one word, you're going to get 10% off. Q&A. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Just kidding. Visit gunfunny.com forward slash contact to submit yours. Today's Q&A is how was Shuta? If you guys didn't hear uh, last episode show, Shuta is a shooting event that takes place in Provo, Utah. And I got to say, I was really, I was actually like really impressed with the event. I've been to a lot of shooting events and I will say like, sometimes it gets a little old. You're like, okay, been there, done that. But this was just, it was really well put together. I'll probably have the guys on my podcast to talk about it, but it was a lot of fun. It was actually really big. Apparently it's just growing more and more. And I don't know if they're going to have it at a new location next year. They definitely are planning on having it next year, but they may have outgrown the location, but they had all kinds of guns. I mean, they had a mini gun, they had a 20 millimeter which I was like, I wasn't ballsy enough to shoot because I just recently started shooting again. And I'm like, I don't really want to mess up my shoulder. They had a cannon. They had a 50 cal on a half track. I mean, they had all kinds of guns that most people typically would not have the opportunity to shoot in their lives. So it was just awesome that, you know, it was open to the public and it gave everybody the opportunity to try out those guns And then there was lots of vendors and yeah, just lots of fun stuff. Hopefully, like I said, I could get the guys that put it on on the show and we can talk about that some more. IWI. If you're looking for a good AR right now, definitely check out the Zion 15 It's the first M4 variant from IWI made right here in the U.S. at the factory in Middletown, Pennsylvania. You can get it in a rifle or pistol version, I guess, at this point. Maybe the pistol version is on hold, but you can also get in the SBR version. The rifle version has a 16-inch 4150 chrome molly barrel chambered in 5.56 with a mid-length gas system. They come equipped with a 15-inch free-flow M-lock handguard for attaching all of your favorite accessories. The grip and the stock are from B5 Systems. Check these out at IWI.us. Remember, if there's anything in the web store that you like, use the code GUNFUNNY15, all one word, and you're going to get 15% off. And again, that is IWI.us. Tactic Talk. Discussing popular guns and gear. Love it? Hate it? Find out now. Forgotten Weapon is new again. Unless you're a regular watcher of Seen Arsenal or Forgotten Weapons, you've probably never heard of an ALOFS system. So I don't know if it's called the ALOFS system or OLAFS. Let's just say it's OLAFS. It was designed by Herman Gurit OLAFS back in 1924. It's a magazine tube autoloader that bolts onto a single shot break action shotgun. It's like a magazine tube that you'd have on a normal pump or a semi, but this one you break open, ejecting the spent round, which triggers a spring loader to pivot and load a new round. Close it back up and you're ready to fire. The original was only made for a few years because it was complicated to install, but it definitely functioned well once it was properly installed. Saloon, and I don't know if I'm saying this right, Saloon Arms in Turkey has developed a modern version called Oslof. Saloon Arms already made multiple single shot break open shotguns and have brought back the antique loader specifically for countries like Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, whose laws now specifically target pump action and semi autos. They even banned several lever action shotguns because they are quote unquote rapid repeaters. The century old magazine conversion gets sportsmen around these new restrictions to provide them with a four plus one or nine plus one two magazine when they would otherwise be stuck with a single shot. 
They're currently offered in four models with wood or synthetic stocks and black or nickel finishes and choice of 13 or 20 inch barrels starting at $400 in Canada. There's no word yet if they're going to be imported into the U.S., but it seems likely since collectors would be interested in the rare design. If you're in Canada, you can check them out at Tactical Imports. Stupid, funny, cool, interesting, awesome, as f- Never mind. AF. Paper Microwave. A Reddit user recently posted a photo of a sign in a hospital break room that is pretty insane. The user said a friend sent it to him after starting a new job in the behavioral health unit of an unnamed Florida hospital. The sheet of paper was taped to a wood surface, presumably next to the microwave, and states microwave $2. So you can purchase a monthly unlimited pass for only $30. Yes, that means that you're required a $2 fee to use the microwave in the break room of the behavioral health unit. Some questioned whether the sign was real or actually a joke, but the person who posted it said that it was true according to his friend who had just started the job and didn't want to be named. His friend had just started the job and after seeing this ridiculous sign, sent him a picture saying, look at this bull blank. Microwaves are apparently available in other areas of the hospital, but if you want the convenience of using it in that unit, it will obviously cost you. Some users had joked about it. One said, I just buy the whole microwave for $2 as advertised. Another had an enterprising idea and said, buy the unlimited pass and charge everyone else a dollar for you to heat their food up. And then another user said, having worked in environments where shared appliances are not taken care of, lunches stolen, messes made, I do not think that this is out of line. I used to bring a George Foreman grill to make sandwiches less than a month before it was so caked with shit that I took it home. The guy who messed it up complained for months afterwards about me taking care of my own belongings. I will say, I mean, I still think this is outrageous, especially, you know, I'm I'm assuming that the microwave is provided by the employer and then to charge $2, I mean, like, I don't know, I guess times are tough and electricity is expensive, but I don't know. It's kind of ridiculous, but I guess on the other hand, I could see like appliances do get messed up. I know when I worked for the New York Yankees and I was in New York, the Keurig machine was so disgusting that I would have to go through a few clean cycles before I would make my coffee or tea because it was just, it was so gross. And then also my biggest pet peeve is people would use those little, you know, they put the K-cup into the Keurig machine, but they wouldn't remove the K-cup afterwards. So it would just sit there. It's hot. It's still covered up and I don't know how long it would be there. And then I would assume that it's growing mold. So it was just so disgusting. So maybe if they're paying for it, they're more likely to take care of it, but On the other hand, I don't think that people would take care of it because they probably feel they're paying for it and they're going to be less likely to clean up the mess. Who knows? Either way, pretty crazy. Hopefully, you know, after maybe some employers get word, maybe they'll change that. Okay, so we do have an iTunes review from Clayton Lothar titled, Ava, this is my favorite gun podcast, five stars. You always have great guests and good information while keeping it easy to listen to. Keep up the good work and stay safe out there. And I guess since you are the only person to leave a review, congratulations, you are the winner. I'm actually going to send out prize packs this week. So hopefully, you know, if you get this in time, send me a good mailing address and I will get that out to you. And now it's time to wrap up. So guys, you can find me at gunfunny.com. There's links to all of my social media, my YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. You can listen to the show on iTunes, iHeartRadio, or even just right on the website. If you enjoy the show and you want to donate, I would greatly appreciate it. It helps me keep up with Peach's, you know, insatiable diet. She's been eating about five to six meals a day and well, you know, food's getting expensive. (laughs) No, thankfully, she's only six pounds, so she could eat as much as she wants, and I still don't have to buy more dog food for like a month. But if you do want to support the show, head on over to gunfunny.com, click on the support the show link and become a patron, one-time donation or monthly donation, and you automatically get entered into a drawing where you have a chance to win a $300 gift certificate from Blown Deadline 
I also want to thank the $25 Patreons who are Corbin Bonafide, Iraq Veteran 8888, Sake Holsters, Daniel Treadwell, Keith Callamore, Daniel Lee, Nick Theodosian, Tristan Smith, and Melissa Ridings. And then, of course, King of the Patreon is Jon Snow. I also wanted to thank Patrick, who I think we lost. I think there was a, a connection issue. I'll email him after this. But thank you, Patrick, for listening to all the women and creating a really nice line for us to wear when we want to be tactical or I don't know. I mean, like I said, even that jacket that I got, most people would probably not even know that it was like, you know, they wouldn't even think it was tactical. It, it kind of screams like Lululemon vibes, if we're being honest. So again, if you guys want to check that out, head on over to Beretta.com. As always, guys, I will talk to you next week and I will let you know how it goes with my foundation. So stay tuned for that. I'll talk to you soon. Want to send feedback? Tell us about a company or anything else. Go to gunfunny.com forward slash contact.